The following podcast is being made available to you by the Samaritan Suicide Prevention Center in New York City, which is part of the International Suicide Prevention Network with over 400 centers in 42 countries and the organization that operates New York City's 24-hour suicide prevention hotline, public education and awareness programs, and support groups for survivors of suicide loss. This recording is part of Samaritan's ongoing effort to share what it has learned over the past 30 years about the keys to responding to people in crisis, from answering over 1.2 million calls from those who are depressed or in distress on its suicide prevention hotline, and providing crisis response and communications training to over 40,000 lay and professional caregivers and health providers who work in school, community, nonprofit, and government health settings. Responding to frequent requests from both lay and professional caregivers for basic guidelines to follow when responding to an individual who is in distress, depressed, or suicidal, Samaritan's Executive Director Alan Ross provides an overview of a simple crisis communications model that can be used by anyone wanting to provide support to a person in crisis. And now, Samaritan's Director and Lead Trainer, Alan Ross. Helping someone in crisis can appear to be an overwhelming task. What do I do? Where do I begin? What should I or shouldn't I say? Can I actually do this? We have a lot of questions in our heads and it's understandable and advisable that we should proceed with caution. The good news is that most people in the suicide prevention field will tell you that with a realistic attitude and the right approach, you can help someone who is depressed in crisis and suicidal and respond in an effective manner. First, it is important to remind ourselves that people are not problems to be solved. They're not mysteries to be unraveled. We are not detectives gathering clues, trying to put a jigsaw puzzle together. We're not forensic scientists trying to solve a crime. Depression, distress, self-harming, and even suicide behavior are not states of mind that if you say the right thing, a switch will go off and everything will suddenly be okay. People in crisis, like all of us, are complex and unique and shaped by more forces and elements than we can possibly understand or even imagine. Take your own behavior, for example. How often is it that you do things or behave a certain way that you don't really know why? How often have you said, why did I do that? What was I thinking? I can't believe I said that. In crisis response work, there's a good phrase to remind us about the keys to helping what we at Samaritans call befriending. Have great respect for that which you do not know. This is best illustrated if you think of a person's emotional makeup as an iceberg. As you know, more than 75% of an iceberg sits below the waterline. We can only see a small part of it. But it's the part underneath the water that is most dangerous. If it was only what could be seen the Titanic would never have sunk and would have managed to sail away. People are like that, too. We see what's on the surface, what's above the waterline, but not what's below. The forces that have shaped their history, their past experiences, childhood, possible trauma or abuse, unresolved issues, low self-esteem, conflict with family, friends, genetic predispositions... All the things that have impacted them, that made them who they are, and make them see things the way they do. Problems and issues and experienced psychotherapists could take a lifetime to figure out. So this iceberg theory tells us that crisis response work, whether for friends, family, co-workers, or professionally, is ongoing process work. It takes time. It has to be done slowly with care for the person and what they are thinking and feeling, whether we understand it or not. People see things the way they see them, and if we're going to help them, the first step is to connect with them from their perspective and realize that the circumstances that led them to this emotional crisis took time to develop 
And it's going to take time and patience and ongoing support to help someone get through it. We start every Samaritan's hotline training with this phrase. You don't solve other people's problems for them. It's hard enough to handle your own. You don't save another person's life. You help him or her get through a moment. We help people who are depressed in crisis and suicidal by following the five C's of helping. Contact, comfort, communications, catharsis, which is pressure release, helping people to get their feelings out in a safe environment, and community. We prevent suicide by making a connection. We provide ongoing support in a caring, empathetic manner. We use our act of listening to establish rapport and further that connection. We assist that person in expressing their thoughts and feelings without responding with our own judgments or values. And we utilize the many resources, mental health professionals, programs, and services in our community. This is something everybody can do. It just takes time and patience and the willingness to suspend our judgments and put the focus on someone else and have great respect for that which we do not know. Whether you are a caring friend or a loved one or a teacher, mental or public health professional, it's always comforting to have a framework or some kind of protocol that you can follow when responding to a person who is depressed or in crisis. A basic crisis communication model will give you a structure that you can use in all kinds of emotional support and crisis response situations. The six stages of this model are organized in a way to keep the focus on the person you are trying to help. The six stages are making first contact, establishing rapport, exploring the present situation, looking and listening for warning signs and risk factors, assessing suicide risk, and exploring options. It is a 7-10 to minute model with the emphasis being on active listening, developing rapport, and focusing on what the person is thinking and feeling. The first contact, no matter how well we know the person, sets the tone for the entire conversation. As we say at Samaritans, it takes 10 seconds to create a first impression and 10 years to change it. Establishing rapport is the foundation for all emotional support and crisis response work. Developing trust and a sincere connection with a person is the key. Without it, we will be on the outside looking in, instead of with that person, holding their hand, helping them get through the moment. Rapport building is always open-ended. As we continue to build rapport with a person, the focus is on their thoughts and feelings, not facts and information. What the person is thinking and feeling now, this moment, the one we are in. We continue to steer towards what they are feeling now and listen and observe risk factors, warning signs, and protective factors. The circumstances and behaviors that give us insight into their current state of mind and provide us with an emotional profile of what they're dealing with. Somewhere between 7 and 10 minutes into this conversation, we do what is called a suicide risk assessment. A series of questions, these are close-ended, that will give us insight into how much the person has visualized and planned a possible suicide attempt or some other self-destructive action. If we have heard any warning signs or risk factors and talk of suicide or self-destructive behavior, we do a suicide risk assessment. If in doubt, we check it out. It never hurts to ask someone about suicide. In fact, it's always a good idea because people who are suicidal will usually tell us what they are thinking. Finally, and only after we have gone through all the previous stages, we can explore options and possible resources. Remember, the focus is on the person we are talking to, not on ourselves. Our goal is to make that all-important connection 
to let that person know by our actions, our willingness to be a support person and not someone who is trying to take control, that they are not alone, there is someone who cares, that we take them seriously, and we are just one element of a larger caring community available to them to help them through their difficult time. Whenever we are concerned about a person who we think might be depressed or suicidal, we should do a suicide risk assessment. The suicide risk assessment is part of a larger crisis communication model or emergency response protocol. A basic version of the suicide risk assessment consists of four questions that let us know how much the person in crisis has visualized or thought about suicide. The questions are close-ended as opposed to the open-ended we use to establish rapport. The questions are, does that person have thoughts about suicide? This is asked in the context of our conversation, picking up on the person's own words and phrases. It might be something like, Geraldo, you said that you were really frustrated, that you felt that nobody was listening to you and you wished you could just run away. Has it gotten to the point that you're thinking about suicide? If the person responds no, or not really, we always say, I want you to know if you were, you could always tell me. They may just not be ready to admit it, or maybe they haven't even admitted it to themselves, or maybe they're afraid to even say it out loud. But we always leave the door open. We never say good if someone says that they are not suicidal. If the person says, yeah, I guess there are times that I feel that way, we respond by asking them when and under what circumstances and what goes through their mind when they have these thoughts. We continue the questions with, do you think of how you would do it? We're asking them, do they have a plan? If they say, I guess I would shoot myself or I have pills or I live in a building with a high floor and I'd probably jump. Then we ask about the means. You said you would take pills. Do you have those pills? What kind of pills are they? You said that you live in a high floor. Where do you live? We're trying to get more specific, not play detective or police officer, as if they are going to get in trouble for admitting their suicidal thoughts or plan. And finally, we ask if they have set a time. You said that you thought you would take pills and you had some painkillers left over from your grandmother when she was in the hospital. Have you thought about when you would take them? Suicidal thoughts, a plan, means available, and time set. Those are basic questions. The more yeses you get to these questions, the higher the person's degree of risk. If someone has suicidal thoughts, plan, means available, and time set, we explore if there's been previous attempts in their family or if they have attempted before. There are many other questions that we might ask, but these are the basics. If someone has thoughts, plan, and means available, we do not leave them alone. It does not mean that they are going to commit suicide. It means that they are high risk, and we should pay close attention to them and remain by their side while we explore other actions or resources we may utilize to assist them in handling this difficult situation. We thank you for listening and hope that you have found this short presentation of value. To learn more about the work of Samaritans, the keys to effective crisis responses, and where to find additional suicide prevention information and resources, go to www.samaritansnyc.org.